Thank you so much for staying to the end of this conference. It's been so great so far, and I'm really, really happy to be here. Um, I want to start by saying a disclaimer, which a lot of people have said in this conference too, is that views are my own. Um, and so let me tell you a little bit about who I am. I used to work for Doctors Without Borders for the past six years, uh, doing communications and advocacy. So I was Originally based in the New York office, I was running a campaign um, getting Pfizer to lower the price of the pneumonia vaccine. And after they lowered the price, um, I switched over to a field contract. So I did a mission in Kibera, Kenya, and then last summer. And beginning of this year, I was based in Myanmar, and I finished my mission earlier this year. So at Doctors Without Borders, um, we put out a lot of reports about public health issues, right? And as a communications manager, my job is to tell stories, to get attention, and get the right kind of media attention around these issues. So I care a lot about how our work is perceived because it has a real impact on um, the populations that we work in and, and our operations. And I've noticed these days that you know our world is more and more polarized. And I'm not just talking about like the US elections, you know, I, I think the issue really started with the birth of social media, right? You know, because of how things get optimized on social media, we like headline news, we like things in photo format, and we like small sound bites, right? And over time, that's really changed our behavior. It shrank our attention span, you know, um, and it really changes how we consume content. And as a result, you know, a lot of information gets taken out of context. And I think that's why a lot of our news feels really sensational and we feel really divided as a human race. So today I want to talk about what considerations we have to keep in mind when creating data stories in this environment. Um, and let me clarify like what I mean by data storytelling. You know, so I'm not here to talk about the ethics of data science or how to put together a good data analysis. I'm just going to go ahead and assume that everyone in this room uh, cares a lot about the integrity of your data work, right? But what happens when your analysis is done and you're ready to, you know, publish it either as a business report or go to the media or just something that you push online? You know, what happens to it then? You know, what considerations do we have to keep in mind? And how do we essentially, you know, protect the integrity of our analysis when it's ready for the world to see? Um, I think I want to start by giving an example of, of that illustrates kind of the challenge that we're working in. This is an article that was published by The Guardian earlier this year, and the headline says, Revealed. Facebook hate speech exploded in Myanmar during Rohingya crisis. It's very dramatic, it's very sensational. And reading the headline alone gives the impression that everyone in Myanmar is posting hateful things about the Rohingya population on Facebook. But if you read uh, a couple of paragraphs down to the article, it gives the source of the data. And this study pulled comments from one Facebook group called the Mabata, and the Mabatha is a hardline nationalist Buddhist organization with a following of around 55,000 people by, at the time this data was pulled. So that is inherently not representative of the whole country. And really what this study found was that hate speech exploded in a hardline national group during the Rohingya crisis. And it's irresponsible to imply that the views of this one group as representative of the entire country, which has many ethnicities, each with their own identity and their values. All right, so I reached out to the researcher, his name is Ray Serrato, um, because he published a really well-documented GitHub post um, that shows the data, its limitations, and his way of thinking when he was processing this information. And I wondered how all that context got lost in the published article. And we talked about how a lot of times this is just out of the control of researchers and even communications managers. Because when we hand off our data analysis to the media, even with briefing, even with context, we also hand over control of how the story is told. So one of, that's one of the challenges that we have to deal with is once your data story goes out into the world, it can grow and take on a life of its own. 
I also noticed um, another kind of interesting response is that in the U.S. on social media, there was so much outrage over Facebook regarding this article. And I fundamentally believe in uh, holding tech companies accountable for how their platforms are used to spread hateful speech. And I really, really hope that they invest more in their detection technology. But I wondered why we don't have that same outrage towards YouTube for how ISIS uses their platform to spread hateful ideology. And Ray and I got to talking and we acknowledged that the time period when this article came out really impacted people's perceptions. This article was published in April this year, and that was right at the height of the Facebook Cambridge Analytica scandal. So people were already outraged at Facebook, and this just gave them more evidence to not trust Facebook. So this is the next challenge that we have to keep in mind, is that the news ecosystem has a way of impacting the way, uh, impacts the way people absorb our data. Right, we are affected by what we see in the news and that affects how we respond to this kind of information. So what considerations do we have to keep in mind to protect the integrity of our data story? The first consideration um, is, can my data be misinterpreted? And to help you assess this, this question, I will recommend two filters. The first, um, is what I'll call a meme filter, right? So whether we like it or not, the world in which we live in optimizes everything online for like quick reactions and quick views, right? And I remember publishing like a Facebook campaign a couple of years ago, and when you're setting up the ad, it runs it through this tool that tests, calculates the ratio be, uh, between image and text. And if we had too much text, we had to cut it out. And so it's optimized that everything comes into meme format, right? Can you imagine if instead of calculating image to text, Facebook built a tool that validated truth instead? Right, so the idea of a meme filter is um, breaking down your, your data analysis into little bite-sized chunks. Right? And imagine if one of those data points was pulled out, plucked out, and became a story on its own, would it tell the same story message as your entire report? Okay, so here's an example. We published a report on the right shot, bringing down barriers to affordable and adaptive vaccines. It is 124 pages of really good data, um, but the, the thing that made news and made headlines was that it's 68 times more expensive to vaccinate a child in 2014 compared to 2001. Right, and so, you know, essentially that it's the same story message. Vaccine prices are too high, kids are not getting vaccinated. That passes, right? And if it doesn't pass a meme filter, uh, then you have to consider what other crucial information that this has to be paired with to give the overall picture. So the next filter I would pass this through is a news filter, right? Earlier I just gave an example of how the news per impacts our perception. And so you can be really strategic about this. You can bring in some communications professionals and we can put together a media report for you. Um, or you can be really technical, you know, pull, scrape some comments off a news website and do some sentiment analysis, like what are people saying online? You know, or you can just do a gut check and log into social media and just kind of see what people are saying online. But whatever way or however way you do it, just take time to get a pulse of what's going on in the news. So the next consideration is, how might this impact the people involved? And by people involved, I mean the people in your study, the people paying you to do the study, the people who are going to read your study, and any other kind of dynamics that, you could, that could be impacted. And I think it's really easy to remember this when you're working with humanitarian data, um, but it's equally important to think of this when we're working with data that seems, you know, that is not too sensitive. And I'll give an example. So uh, the Pew Research Center put out a report about Asian Americans, that we are a very diverse and growing population. It's great, I love this story message. But then I noticed something that I, I couldn't ignore. Um, I identify as Taiwanese American, and we are not listed as one of the Asians in the US, right? So I looked a little bit further into the data and saw that here we are in a footnote. Chinese includes those identifying as Taiwanese. 
right? And so my whole existence is kind of reduced down into a footnote. And what this tells me is that, you know, I do not matter enough to be included. And this tells all the marketers or researchers who look at this study that it's okay to group in this way. And you bet that this impacts my life every day to the point where people, you know, whenever they ask, where are you from? From California. No, 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 where are you really from? And I say, my family's from Taiwan. Their answer is usually, oh, do you mean Thailand? Or, oh, so you mean Chinese, right? And so now I have a stranger explaining my identity <laughs> to me. And so I'm not going to get into the politics of this because that's not my point here, you know, but the point that I'm trying to make and what I really want to get across is that, you know, all this data that we look at, all the insights we gather and the modeling and forecasting, you know, what makes big data big? And I think what makes big data big is that fundamentally each of these data points represents one human and it has a potential to impact an individual and that is a big responsibility, right? So ultimately what we want to really try to do is to be able to pull out the human in our data, right? We, we heard earlier uh, yesterday from Roger's talk how, how these tools have really transformed the lives of you know, millions of people, it has that potential. But he also mentioned that these tools have their limitations, right? They, on, they only answer kind of the broader, blunt questions and, and not the more subtle context. So my suggestion of how to deal with this dilemma is whenever you can to try to interview and speak to someone who is part of your study population, right? Every time I meet our patients and they share their most traumatic experiences with me, you know, it is a privilege that I get to hear their stories and it is my moral responsibility to make sure I communicate it in a way that is complete with integrity, right? And, you know, we're not alone in trying to like figure this out. You know, I think about this stuff all the time because it was my job to, right? But we all have play a role in, you know, how our data stories get told. And traditionally, this is the flow of telling data stories, right? It starts out with the analyst, you know, you look at the data, and once you get some insights, you pass it over to the advocacy um, folks. So, you know, what kind of ask can we make? What kind of decisions can we be informed by this? And then once it's ready, it gets passed down to communications and say, we're ready for dissemination, right? Um, and I really want to encourage a different kind of workflow. You know, one where advocacy and communications are brought in right at the beginning and we work hand in hand and coordinated in the design process of this analysis. You know, this allows us to, from the get go, get a good, you know, scope of what are our objectives and at each stage of the development, we can really keep in mind the ethics of data storytelling. And ultimately, it, it makes us all do our job better Right, you know, we can really design an experience that tells the, per the story that you want to tell. And I will end by showing one example, my favorite thing that I've done, um, is, you know, turning a data point into performance art. <laughs> so the, d the data point was that, you know, 2,500 kids die from pneumonia each day, right? But how do you visualize that? I can just tell you that. But 2,500, like, what does that, what does that feel like, you know? It feels like a lot in some contexts, it doesn't feel like a lot in other contexts, right? So what we chose to do was we bought um, 2,500 flowers and we did a procession from Grand Central Station in New York all the way to Pfizer's headquarters in New York, which is about two avenues of walk. And you know, we had people hold these flowers and march slowly and silently in like this bustling New York City vibe. They walked all the way to the headquarters and once we got to the front doors, there was this crib, brand new crib, and we had people place flowers one by one, very slowly. You know, and the impact is that when you're, when you're participating in this activity, you know, you're walking with with these flowers, it ended up being around like 20 flowers per person, you realize that each of these flowers represents a baby who, who won't go home with their parents tonight. You know, and that kind of impact really like drives in the message um, 
for the people experiencing it. And, uh, and the final kind of imagery was this like pristine crib overfilling with flowers, you know, 2,500 flowers on the floor. And it also had an impact on Pfizer, you know, and now they had this like giant crib that they had to move indoors and it sparked a lot of conversations, you know, in their office. And the next day we attended their shareholder meeting and the CEO reacted to this performance, you know, this protest. And as a result of that, you know, we were able to have a meeting with the CEO and months and months and months later of negotiation, more campaigning, they finally dropped the price. And as a result, you know, now we can vaccinate kids in places that we haven't been able to before. You know, now we're using this vaccine to um, vaccinate refugee children in Syria. You know, so when we work together and we, you know, this might look really like abstract and artsy, but we really work together and design a, the right kind of experience. You know, it can make a really, really big impact. You know, so I really want to encourage that we continue to have these conversations, right? Because, you know, I brought up a lot of considerations that won't always have answers, but we have to keep asking them because it will push our work and it will push the impact that we want to deliver. Thank you.